though you want to make me fearful, though you want to kill me, I will complete my course. I will not veer off. I will not slow down. I will not hurry up and leave. And I will not pull back. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 31, starts like this. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, what is that very hour? If you remember in that previous text, that previous passage there in Luke chapter 13, Jesus had been teaching the multitudes and he had been teaching them when he had been asked the question, Lord, are there few who enter into heaven? And what's his answer? Yes, there are few who enter into heaven. But he says, strive, agonize, labor, put forth all of your effort in order to get to heaven, in order to make it through the narrow door. And it was a call. It's a call to repentance. It's a call of grace. But then Jesus says something that would have infuriated the Jews who had been listening to him who were unwilling to come. The Pharisees who were unwilling to listen and heed his call for repentance and for God's grace. Because you remember that he tells them, he says, in that place, Luke 13, 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. Remember, he's speaking to a Jewish audience, and this would have really stuck with the Pharisees, that he tells them, your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the ones you hold up above everyone else, they'll be in heaven, but you won't. And you're going to look into heaven, you'll see them, and you will find yourself cast out. And it will anger you, it will grieve you, and it will break your heart such that you will weep, and you will wail, and you will grind your teeth. Have you ever been in pain like that? Hurt so bad that you ground your teeth and you just wanted something to sink your teeth in? Jesus says it's going to be like that forever. You can see that must have really infuriated the Pharisees because they were the teachers of the law. They were the interpreters of the law. These are the keepers of God's word. And yet he calls them hypocrites. He calls them liars. He says, you're like whitewashed tombs. You look pretty on the outside, but inside you're just dead. You're liars. And you're going to see the prophets in heaven, but you yourself cast out. That would have incensed the Pharisees. But Jesus takes it another step further, and he tells them this in 20, verse 29 of Luke 13. He says, and people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. Not only will they find themselves cast out, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in heaven, but he's talking now about the nations, about the Gentiles, people from north and south in every direction. They will be in heaven, but the Jews would not. Those who had rejected him, those Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers who continually rebuked Jesus and looked for him to stumble, they hated Jesus. That's the group of people that comes to him now. And they're infuriated. It says at that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, you remember that Jesus had been calling them liars. He's been calling them hypocrites. The Bible tells us, us this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. It says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him. How to destroy him. Luke 11 Verse 54 tells us that the Pharisees were lying in wait for Jesus. Which essentially means this, that behind every bush, behind every corner, wherever Jesus showed up to teach, there was a Pharisee. He was the fly on the wall. And he's just waiting, hoping that Jesus would say something wrong or he's listening for something that he can twist and manipulate so that they could destroy Jesus, so they could put him in prison, so that they could kill him, so that at minimum they could cast him out and shut him up because he's continually rebuking them and he's continually calling them to repentance. Now look at what they say. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. 
Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee, literally meaning he is the ruler. He is a governor of Galilee. A tetrarch is one of four rulers. All four of these rulers in the region Jesus lived and did his ministry, all four of these rulers were not Jews. They were Romans. In fact, they were Idumeans. Okay? The Jews hated them. They hated Herod and Philip and Herod Archelaus. They hated him and his brothers. These were the people who were oppressing them. These were the people collecting taxes for the Romans. The Romans were occupying the promised land. And they were oppressing the Jews at every turn. And now the Pharisees come and they say, Hey, Jesus, watch out. You need to leave because Herod is seeking to kill you. Now, I think there are two possibilities of what's going on here. One, maybe the Pharisees are lying. Maybe the Pharisees haven't talked to Herod at all. Remember, they hated him. All the Jews did. Maybe they're lying to Jesus. And maybe they're just trying to tell him a falsehood and stir him up to fear so that he'll leave, so that he'll be quiet. They're trying to scare Jesus. That would be within their character to lie. They're not above being hypocrites, which that's what a hypocrite is. He's a liar. Second possibility is this. Maybe they were telling the truth. And maybe Herod really did want to kill Jesus. That would not be very far from the truth, would it? In fact, that's the M.O. of Herod's family. Tell you a little bit about Herod. Herod's daddy was also named Herod. He was Herod Jr. Herod's daddy was Herod the Great. Herod the Great. And you remember Herod the Great is the one who issued the edict to have all the babies killed because he heard that Jesus was being born. So he said, kill all the babies. The Herods don't play around. And they want somebody dead, they kill them. In fact, Herod Antipas, which is the Herod that we're dealing with here this morning, Herod Antipas did something extremely, extremely evil. Get this for a family saga, okay? Herod Antipas had divorced his wife in order to marry his brother Philip's ex-wife. Follow that? He divorced his own wife and to marry his brother's ex-wife. And you remember John the Baptist came to Herod Antipas and what did he say? It's not right for you to have your brother's wife. And it angered Herod, didn't it? In fact, it angered his wife even more, Herodias. And they were bitter about it because John had called them to repentance. And you remember that Herodias' daughter began to dance at that party that one night. There was a lot of alcohol involved there, and she began to dance. And Herod got so excited, he was so pleased, that he told Herodias' daughter, I'll give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom. What is it that she asks for? She wants John's head. What does Herod say? No problem. Coming right up. We're talking about a man's head here. And so he sends the executioner. They lop John's head off, put it on a plate, and bring it to the party. Herod's a dangerous guy, isn't he? If Herod wants somebody dead, they're as good as dead. Herod is a very powerful, in fact, an immensely powerful man. But I love Jesus' response. This is not your typical Sunday school answer. Okay, regarding Jesus. Look at what Jesus says to Herod. <laughs> Verse 32, he said, And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. I love that. Jesus is so strong and bold in the face of adversity. He will not cower in fear for this man who lopped John's head off. In fact, see, in fact he calls him a fox. He says, Herod, you're just a scavenger. You live in your little hole and you are scared of your own shadow. You're nothing more than a little wild dog that feeds on the remains of dead animals. That's all you are, Herod. This is a pretty significant insult. You fox, you varmint. You realize that's what he says. That's not your typical Jesus speak there, is it? Why does Jesus call Herod insignificant? Why does he call him a little fox? I think it's because of this. 
in light of God's ordained, sovereign plan for Jesus, Herod is insignificant. Jesus would complete his task, and no one would make him to veer off of his course. He was set resolute to go to Jerusalem. He wasn't going to back down. He wasn't going to pull away. No matter how much people said, you need to be scared, you need to be fearful, you need to walk away, you need to run away. Who's Herod in light of the power that Jesus declares here? Look at what he says. I love this. This is amazing. And he said, go and tell that fox, behold, one, I cast out demons. Two, I perform cures. And three, on the third day, I finish my course. Jesus says, who are you, Herod? I have power over hell. I cast out demons. Satan is nothing against me. I have power over the devil and demons. Secondly, he said, I perform cures today and tomorrow. I have power over disease. I have power over the body. I have power over creation. If somebody's sick, I can heal them. Notice what he says the last. He said, and on the third day, I finished my course. We know that Jesus is speaking prophetically here, isn't he? Of his resurrection. Jesus says, Herod, buddy, not only do I have power over demons and over disease, but you've got to understand I hold the keys of life and death. I have power over the grave. You are insignificant. Such are all people who oppose God's plan. Such are all people who would strive to make us fearful to complete God's task. Jesus was resolute. He says this, Herod, though you want to make me fearful, though you want to kill me, I will complete my course. I will not veer off. I will not slow down. I will not hurry up and leave. And I will not pull back. I think our application is pretty simple to take from this. Whatever ministry God has set for you, you don't hurry up. Don't slow down. Don't pull back. And don't change course. You have no one to fear but God. That's it. Jesus calls Herod a fox. Insignificant varmint. Folks, there are a lot of Herods in this world. And there will be Herods in this world until the Lord comes back. There will be people in authority who would seek to stop what God is doing in this church, in this world, in your life, through your ministry. There will be Herods from now until the Lord returns. Don't change your course. Don't hurry up and leave. And don't pull back. You just stay the course because in light of God's sovereign plan over your life, in light of his power, he's the one who holds power over hell and over disease and over death. In light of his power, no one who comes against you is going to prosper. Jesus said this. He said already, hasn't he? Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not, yet not one of them falls to the ground without my father's consent. How much more valuable are you than a sparrow? Whatever God has set for you, you just do it. And you set your face, no matter how fearful somebody wants to make you, or no matter how much somebody wants to deter you from completing the task God has for you, nothing will happen to you without your father's consent. And moreover, he tells us this. He says, not one hair on your head has gone unnumbered. God cares for you, God loves you, and God makes you able to be resolute to complete whatever task he has for you. Go the course, don't change, don't hurry up, and don't pull back. Look at what Jesus says in verse 33. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Jesus speaks this almost like a proverb. That if a, if a, if a prophet's going to die, he's going to die in Jerusalem. How ironic is that? How tragically ironic is that? 
that the majority of God's prophets have died in Jerusalem. The place that should have been so ready to receive them, the place that had seen the glory of God, and yet it's the place that the prophets go to die. It's tragic. The people who should have received the message of repentance and of grace are the ones who destroy the messenger. Folks, I want, to, I want you to listen to me very carefully. So often, people who are not humbled by the call to repentance are hardened by it. Do you hear me? So often, people who are not humbled by the call to repentance are hardened by it. When you don't want to walk away from what God says, walk away from. He says it in love because it's killing you. It's going to lead you into that broad path, that wide gate that leads to hell. No, Jesus wants you to go through the narrow door. He wants you in heaven. He wants you in heaven so bad, he came to die for you. He wants that. But so many times people hear that call of repentance to turn from your sin, to turn from holding on to this world and pursue everlasting life. And after a while, that message becomes annoying. It becomes irritating. And we respond like this. Would you just be quiet already? I'm tired of hearing that. And that call of repentance, if it's not heeded, often hardens the very same heart. Maybe this morning, with this many people in here, it's a guarantee. There are people in this room who have been hearing God call on them. Who have been hearing God say, would you follow me? You know these things are killing you. You know you need to give your life to me. Would you just do it? And you've heard that call over and over again. And after a while, it becomes irritating. Don't let that beat that way today. Just say, okay, God, whatever you want from me. Would you respond like Samuel today? And say, here am I, Lord. Your servant is listening. See, for some people, the gospel call, that call of repentance from sin, that is literally the turning away from sin, is as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, it is the scent of death unto death. But for those who are being saved, Paul says it's a sin of life unto life. Some people hear that gospel message that says, turn from the things that are killing you, and they say, there's life. There's everlasting life. I'll leave anything behind. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Of course I'll give up anything to have Jesus. He's life. He's everything. He is the wisdom and power of God to me. Would you respond that way today? Don't let that call of repentance harden your heart and become irritating. So often, people who are not humbled by the call of repentance are hardened by it. Now, I want everybody in here, I want you to hear God's heart for people this morning. I want you to hear God's love for you. And I want you to, to see and to feel the broken heartedness of God towards people who reject him. I want you to see that God really does love you. Look at verse 34. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Do you hear the heart of God there? Do you hear that pleading? Do you feel that grief? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the seat of my love. I would have loved you. I would have taken you in. And you would have fellowshiped with me. But you weren't willing. Many of you know of King David. I would venture to say everybody in here has read in the Old Testament about King David. You've heard stories about King David. You probably know his most famous son, Solomon. Solomon was the king who had all this glory 
in Jerusalem. He's the one who built the magnificent temple, that first temple. There was no one with wealth like his in all of the world. No one with glory like his in all of the world. No one with wisdom like his in all of the world. But do you know that there was a black sheep in David's family? There was a black sheep by the name of Absalom. Many of you may have not heard of that name, Absalom. In 2 Samuel chapter 18, we read about this young man. Very troubled life. Very difficult life, a very hard life. We read in the text that when, Sa- when, when Absalom was a young man, that his sister was raped. His sister was raped by his half-brother, in fact. Pretty terrible, huh? And it ruined Absalom. He was consumed by his bitterness. He's consumed by his hatred. And he waited for years in order to kill that rapist. Finally, he got him alone when they were shearing sheep. And he struck him down. He killed him. And he fled. He ran. Finds himself outside of Jerusalem. Outside of the king's table. Outside of what he thinks is the king's love and he's running and he's hiding lest someone take vengeance on him David hears what happens and David is filled with grief and with mourning and he sends messengers after Absalom and he says Absalom come home Absalom return to Jerusalem return to my table you're forgiven it's okay but over and again in the text we read this that Absalom fled Time and again you read that. Absalom ran. Absalom turned away from the grace of the king. He turned away from David's love. And he turned away from forgiveness and entrance into the kingdom. And David is broken about it. Much like God's heart for people who continually flee. And they run. And they leave. Absalom's life came to a tragic end. Joab, who was David's general, he was his commander. Joab was a cutthroat. This was a hardened man. And they go out. Absalom had subverted David. Then Absalom finds himself outside of the kingdom, doing all manner of wickedness. And finally, Joab and his men are pursuing hot after Absalom. And David had told them, when you find the man, don't kill him. Don't kill the young man. Have mercy on him. Joab's not a merciful character, though. They find themselves in this scene in 2 Samuel 18. They find themselves galloping after Absalom. He's on his mule and he's running and they're chasing behind him. And Absalom, much like he did all of his life, he's riding that mule and he's looking behind him. And as he gallops under that oak tree, the branch grabs him by the throat. Isn't that interesting? He's looking behind him and he can't see what's coming. I think there's probably some lessons in there. The branch grabs him by the throat. And the text tells us this, that Absalom found himself dangling between heaven and between earth. Maybe you find yourself this morning dangling between heaven and earth. Maybe you need to make a choice today for heaven Joab smells blood in the water he comes up to Absalom he sees him there in the tree and as if it was not enough just to kill him he calls out to his men he says you kill Absalom slay the young man and Joab's servant says not for a thousand pieces of silver would I kill the king's son Joab says I don't care And as if one spear was not enough, he takes three spears and he jabs them into Absalom while he's dangling in that tree. And as if that were not enough, he tells his men to surround Absalom and they all take out their swords and they begin to jab him, making sure there's no life left in this young man. Tragic. Take his body down treat him like a criminal, throw his body into a great pit, and then heap stones upon it so David can't even find his body. There was a young man, a Cushite, 
And he runs to David to tell him this news, expecting David to give him some sort of reward, expecting the king to be excited because the rebellion is over. Absalom's not going to pursue your kingdom anymore. You are safe. Your kingdom is safe. So he goes to David and David says, what news of the young man? And the Cushite says, may all of the Lord's enemies be like that young man. May they be dead. Expecting the king to give him some sort of reward or a congratulation, he is severely disappointed because the king is broken. And the text tells us this in 2 Samuel 18, 33. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, would I have died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. And you can hear his cries, his brokenness, his grief, because his son is dead. He is forsaken. He is abandoned. And it's a tragic loss. Oh, Absalom, oh, Absalom. And he weeps bitterly. It's the same thing that Jesus does here for Jerusalem. He looks on Jerusalem with such tragic loss. He says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You can almost feel the tears of Christ as he thinks of this. And he calls out to them. He says, so often would I have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks, but you weren't willing. I wanted you to come. I wanted to fellowship with you. But as the text says, you continually slayed the prophets. You fled like Absalom. You ran. When the book is written about you, what will the text say? Will the text continually read, and he fled, and she ran. And though the king called, she left. She ran. Will you find yourself outside of God's kingdom, outside of his table, outside of his fellowship, when all the while the king is saying your name, Jerusalem, Jerusalem? Will God's heart be grieved over you? Some in here today, you feel God's call. You know it. You know exactly what we're talking about. You feel God's call. And up to this point, the text of your life has said, and she ran, and he ran, and he fled, and he finds himself outside of God's kingdom. Would you change what's written in your text this morning? You still have an opportunity. Absalom has no more chance, no more opportunity. Jesus says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing Behold, your house is forsaken. Your house is desolate. When people turn their heart from God, when they flee from God, 100% of the time, they are fleeing because they feel like they can get fulfillment elsewhere. They feel like they can get life elsewhere. They feel like other things are more valuable. Other things are more profitable. And yet Jesus tells Jerusalem, your house is laid waste. Your house is empty. It's abandoned. It's forsaken. One who rejects Christ normally does it, does it to find fulfillment. But if you reject Christ this morning and you continue to reject him, you will find nothing but emptiness. You find nothing but a forsaken, empty, desolate wasteland. 
and all those things that you pursued in this life when you die, whose will they be? Not yours. Friend, this morning, is God mourning over you? Is Jesus weeping over you? Can you fill your name in to that slot and God say, Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, is that your name? It doesn't have to be any longer. Today, the king is calling to you. The king is calling to you to be restored into his kingdom, to be brought back into his home. And he's saying, it will all be forgiven if you'll just come. I'm just waiting. I want to comfort you. I want to help you. I want to draw you in. Today, you can change what's written in your text. Today, you can respond to God's call. But just remember that if you don't respond to God's call, that oftentimes that very same call will harden your heart. So take today while it's fresh. Take today while your heart is moldable, while it's softened. And would you respond like Samuel and say, here am I, Lord. Your servant is listening. Y'all pray with me.